Uh, welcome everyone to a panel called Buy Organic, Buy Local in the Food uh, Fights track, thanks to Kitty Boone, who is intimidatingly right here. Um, so it's a question that is on the minds of every right-minded foodie, and I assume that I can count all of you in this room as right-minded foodies. You, you had better be. Do I buy organic? Do I buy local? We thought that it was an easy choice uh, years ago, um, and now it is whose rights are we worrying about? Whose health are we worrying about? Um, do we go to farmer's markets or not? I'll expand on that question, but I'll first introduce our panelists. I think that no one needs an introduction to Stuart Resnick um, because he equals Aspen, as does his wife, Linda, who's in the front row. Um, if you have these, I mean, you kn everyone knows that these are thanks to the Resnick. So we have product placement right here on the table, uh, <laughs> which we'll be opening and quaffing throughout the panel. Uh, he's chairman of Roll Global, a Los Angeles-based holding company, but what we really know him for, aside from his, uh, there really, numerous business ventures, um, right here and for this panel is their enormous holdings and uh, the largest grower of almonds in the world, of citrus, of pomegranates, um, pistachios, is it 60% of the world's market? No, we, we process and sell 30% of the world's markets of pistachios. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, only 30%. I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry. 70% um, of what's sold in the United States. Uh, but citrus is enormous. Pomegranates, which they've built into national consciousness. None of us had ever heard of pomegranates, except those of us in college. Uh, I would actually find fresh pomegranates in New Haven more years ago than I want to say and stain my college room trying to split them and seed them. So uh, that's one of my college memories of stains. But uh, the rest of America's heard of pomegranates, thanks to the Resnicks. Um, so Josh Virtel is the head of Slow Food USA, and when I pointed to him about Yale, it was because he began and implemented the Yale Sustainable Food Project, which is, continues to this day and has been a national model for other universities that are interested in involving their students in understanding how food grows. In students who've never had any experience on farms, actually raising food, actually seeing it, come and work on the farm, learn about um, uh, what actually goes into growing and producing good food, and you had a lot to do with improving the school food at Yale, um, and trying to get local products, local products, shorter transport time, into the dining halls, which is anyone who has worked with dining halls, and we'll be talking more about this at school lunch tomorrow, knows is a huge challenge. It's the infrastructure, and it's the supply chain, it's, and it, at Yale it was unions, which were huge, getting union uh, people to change their ways and actually peel carrots instead of opening up plastic bags, um, and it worked. So Josh was very inspiring and continues to be inspiring at Slow Food USA, a national movement he is transformed into really, I think, the chief voice for social justice, yes, and, and, and food rights and getting young people involved in understanding what are involved in food choices. And I think we're going to be asking about that a lot today. Um, but I'm first going to ask Stuart to talk about this choice. I'll frame it as I think that many of you feel it when you go to the market which is you were told to buy organic. Organic seemed like it was the environmentally correct thing to do. It was the right thing to do for the planet. And organic seemed to be the be all and end all for a long time. The passage of the National Organic Food Standard was, it took decades and was an enormous, what year was it? Uh, 2002. 2000, it seems like longer ago, doesn't it? Because there were so many years of argument and comments and review processes and concessions. It was really kind of a titanic battle to pass the organic food standard. And to this day, it remains enormously controversial because of what went in it and what didn't go in, in it. So it actually led to much more availability of organic food, much more possibility to buy organic food. Um, I should mention that Walmart um, was one of the leaders in first bringing organic food to a very wide market and making it um, <coughs> affordable to people. So that became a buying choice that was suddenly open to a lot more people than it had been. Um, but 
as movements like Slow Food USA came into play, as Josh was implementing at Yale, and now many other colleges have been putting into practice, the idea of buying something that was produced locally, by your own community, in your own food shed. Have you all heard the term food shed? You've heard watershed, it's an extension of that. Food shed means, well, it depends on the radius, 400 miles, I mean, what's the food shed? What's your working radius? It really depends on the, the where you, you are. Do. I actually, I don't think it's the best way to measure, but we can talk about it. Oh, actually, I hate the whole <laughs> idea of food sheds. But um, <laughs> in any case, <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying it's become, it's become fashionable and part, of the, and part of the discourse now. The idea that um, every region should be self-sustainable and grow its own food within a certain radius. Um, and we can get into why that is a very controversial idea, and maybe Josh and I agree on this, but we don't want too much agreement. So I'm going to start with <laughs> Stuart and say, you probably were thinking about organic and whether you should go into organic long before the organic food standards were passed. And what was your own business judgment, and what did you try to do with organic? Well, I, I think this was about 15 years ago in the citrus business, we decided to uh, go into organic for two reasons. Number one, we wanted to see whether we could learn something to, uh, if we just farm naturally. I mean, and, and against the, the organic standards, we thought that we could take that capability or learning and bring it to the rest of our crops. So we put a, <coughs> we probably had about 20,000 acres of citrus, and I think we at one time farmed about 600 acres of, uh, of organic citrus. We were the largest organic citrus growers. Um, was it a test or was really a It was really, it was a test, and also we felt that at the time there was a lot of, a lot of um, pushing from retail saying they needed more, they don't have enough, and there was a premium price attached to it. And it was interesting, for the first two or three years we were kind of surprised that we got these very nice yields, although the costs were substantially more. We got some very nice yields, and then about the third or fourth year it just went down to nothing. I mean, very, very expensive for us against the yields. When you and say yields, you don't mean harvest, because yields are very controversial in organic. Some people claim you get actually lower production per acre. Are you talking about the profit spreads? No, no, I'm talking about production per acre. Oh. And what we found was that it cost us substantially more. It took much more resources. Mm -hmm. And we got no benefit. The product was not any better in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we use many, much more input. So, and as I, so I, that was my first experience with it. And the input, do you mean human labor? Well, human labor, look, t there's a lot of scarcities in the environment. One of the biggest ones is water mm -hmm. and, and land. We ended up getting, our experiences generally, you get somewhere between 50 and 60% of the yield per acre if you're doing organic as opposed to what we would call commercial farming or normal farming. So that's a penalty of 40 to 50 percent. Right, and you're using the same amount of water and you're using the same amount of land. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get the same production, you're going to have to use twice the land and twice the water. Mm -hmm. And the other inputs are not inexpensive either. You lose, you're using a, you know, a whole bunch of chicken shit and you, a whole you, bunch of horse manure. <laughs> do you literally mean chicken shit? I literally mean chicken shit. And what was that taking the place of? Well, normal fertilizers. And as a result of that, and it's interesting because before I, I was asked to talk on this panel, I had my own views and we eventually got out of organic farming and felt it was not useful at all. As I started reading some of the notes from my farming people, I now not only think it's useless, I think it's counterproductive. How come? Because, <coughs> again, it's worse for the environment. You're using, you use, one example we had was, again, we, we decided we would do organic pomegranates, because again, we got this push for, well, if you, you know, we, 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 there's a need for it, and the price is about 40% more, and we thought pomegranates are, was a new crop, we didn't see many pests or, issues with it, but we found that by using natural, the f natural fer fertilizers that we were allowed to use, we used four times as much nitrogen 
to get the same result that we would with normal commercial fertilizers, most of that went into the environment. Yeah, that's not good. No, for the soil. so, and we got about, again, 50% of the production at a higher cost. Mm -hmm. So as I went through this, I thought, well, maybe there were some benefits to organic, some minimal ones, but as I read what uh, uh, the people that did the research for me in more detail, it just seems like it's really counterproductive because it's, there's virtually no proof that it's beneficial in any way, shape, or form. We're well, getting a price premium, though, the, the promised price premium. Well, that's interesting. What the retailers are trying to do is differentiate themselves. And once there was, we got a price premium, but they couldn't sell all of the product that we produced, even though it was very small. I mean, I'd say it's maybe in the citrus area, it was two or 3% of the whole crop. Basically, after they bought, you know, we, we maybe we went from, we had uh, increased the supply by 20%, we could sell about half of it at that premium price and the rest they weren't interested in. So did you have to essentially dump it at the same price that you were yeah, selling Yeah, we dumped it at the same price, yes. And it was not so attractive either. Not so good to look at. Right. But for, for pomegranates, that would never matter because you don't sell whole, you do sell whole Yeah, pomegranates? we sell a lot of fresh pomegranates, yes. So sorry. Yeah. I think of this and the, and the bars that we're seeing outside and the million uh -huh. pomegranate products. We sell about uh, 100 million fresh pomegranates. Oh, that's a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 my point remains. So, yeah, cosmetics are very important. Um, and cosmetics have always been a big argument against organic. And that was yeah. something that farmers said from the very beginning. Was it as much of a problem with citrus? Were they... Well, no, I, again, cosmetics are, unfortunately, cosmetics do enter into people's buying decision. However, it really does, it has nothing to do with the benefit, but what's inside, oftentimes. So we didn't have that, the, the issue of uh, cosmetics on uh, organic was less of an issue than on normal because people accepted that. The problem was, again, there was this lack of, Market. really a lack of real demand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, this tremendous price, uh, cost, and the unpredictability of what would happen. So you didn't know from year to year um, what your yield would be. I mean, a period of times we had the normal yield and for years after that, we got about a 50% yield. We'd never get it back again. But why? Why did the yield go down? God. <laughs> because I- No, because you, but look, farming is reasonably scientific now. People, at least in the crops that we're in. Now look, I can't comment on, on everything. I just comment on our own experiences yeah. and my own beliefs. Sure. Now, by the same token, let me tell you clearly that I argue with my wife every month that, that she's wasting money on buying organic, but she still does it. So obviously, there's some, <laughs> there's some reasoning that it's a marketing issue. You, you, basically, you do a lot of research, and there's fertilizers, there's pesticides mm -hmm. that eliminate the, you know, the, the uh, variables of farming. If you have a a particular pest that attacks an orchard and you can't use anything to defeat that pest, well, you're gonna get a much lower yield. And also, <coughs> the use of fertilizer, that the fertilizers one uses now are much more productive because of the way they, they get into the uh, soils and they're absorbed than the normal fertilizers that people have used. Again, a lot of, you know, cow manure. Or they're more efficient. They're much, much more And you much can buy efficient. less and get as good a, a production. But, you know, when you say there is nothing available for these pests, I thought that part of the organic manifesto, and Josh is going to be ringingly, ringingly combating every single point you've made. I hope he or, does. Or maybe, <laughs> or maybe a couple of them, is that, yes, there may not be as efficient and deadly a, and quick a product, but there are many, many organic alternatives that are part of the organic food standard, which itself is controversial because many people think there are a whole bunch too many products available under it. The criticism is usually they take longer to work and they're more expensive, but did you try any of them? We tried all of them. Oh, so you kept trying all Yeah, we stuff. tried them. I mean, look, we were serious about this mm -hmm. and we did it, not only did we do it in, um, uh, Citrus, we also did it in uh, pistachios. Not there, not necessarily for the marketing, but again, to see if there's some things that we could do to get away from 
either pesticides or fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And we found that it just didn't work. And I remember once when I went to our um, pistachio acreage, when we had do doing this organic um, farming, it was the most gorgeous thing because we had all these wildflowers in between that's supposed to act to eliminate a lot of the pests. Yeah. Now, it was, didn't work, but it was sure pretty. <laughs> <laughs> This breaks the heart of all of us who want beautiful <laughs> landscapes and want organic farming. Right. You know, the idea that, well, it was beautiful, but it was useless um, and counterproductive. Um, so how long did this experiment last? Uh, we would, on the pomegranates, we did it for about six years. Mm -hmm. That is a good and while. A substantial amount we did, actually. And on uh, citrus, we probably did it for six or seven years, and we still have some small plots, again, just to continue to see as a learning experience about how we might apply some of the principles of organic to non-organic. Again, there's an economic reason, you mm -hmm. know, how can you do it? And we're very involved in the area of um, uh, mating disruption, which is a, a natural uh, way to eliminate pests, which do not deal with any pesticides. And so we're very you release active in that. pheromones into the air, right? And so what we're we're very uh, very unfair to the to the insects because what we do is a um, a female releases pheromones and that's the way the male is attracted. So we make synthetic pheromones which are totally harmless, and we spray them over. Not we sp put. Um, cans out, little spray cans, and they spray all this pheromone, and so the male can't find the female. So they don't reproduce, and that's what causes the problem with pests, is when they reproduce. So we do try, because that's a, we, because pesticides also lose their, their uh, efficacy over time. Mm -hmm. So we think, and that's been a pretty good, um, and we work, continue to work on that, and that's getting more and more exposure. So God made the yield go down, which was already <laughs> very discouraging for this experiment. Why should we continue if our yields are going down every year? But what about the demand? Did you, even with your lower yields, have to wind up dumping this product and not getting the price premium? Or in fact, did the demand increase? Th there wasn't that big a demand. And the premium, you just couldn't get the premium. Mm -hmm. And what worries me about this um, is that it's really a marketing gimmick, in my opinion. And I'm not saying that there's not better fruit and worse fruit and different ways to grow, particularly fruit, that come to market and is in the end you get a better <coughs> result. But organic isn't that process. Organic is a process that has nothing to do with um, the end result. It's just mm -hmm. how you do something. And in the end, it doesn't, you don't end up with a better product. You can end up with a better product doing the normal farming or organic. I mean, you can have a good product with organic, but because it's organic, it doesn't mean it's a good product. Um, that's great, and I'd like to move on to organic before we get on to local, and, and while thoughts are fresh on Josh's mind about just the organic versus conventional farming, would you like to sure. take uh, that? This is a complicated one. Your, your input, it sounds like this was going to be a conversation about which is better organic or local Everybody's and maybe. Everybody's going to leave with an opinion. <laughs> You'll all have an opinion formed by the time you leave this You've got Stuart That's saying, no, the question's which is worse. <laughs> <laughs> they're both worse. And I'm saying, no, they're both better. <laughs> it's no, I, I, I believe that in many instances, local is, is better mm -hmm. if you can we do it. We're on to local yet. Okay, we'll get fine. To, we'll okay, okay, we'll get to local. I want to okay. hear about so, organic. Um, first, I just, I know a lot of, uh, I know a lot of farmers have had a really different experience than you, but I also know some have had your experience. And it's important to, I think, empathize with it and listen from it and learn from it. Uh, I see a lot of promise in organic agriculture, and, and I see the demand exploding. There are certain sectors where it's exploding less and le than in others, um, but I also see incredible environmental impact that it can have that's positive, and also incredible yield impacts that are positive. Um, one of the real challenges in shifting to organic agriculture is that we've, we've built up a chemical agriculture system over the last 40 years, and 40 to 60 years. And in that chemical agriculture system, we're, we're, we're basically trying to short circuit what happens in ecology and biology and substitute in chemistry. And so we look at, this gets a little complicated, so I'm sorry for this, but three basic nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. We try to feed plants with those three basic nutrients. There's some micronutrients we put down. And we make sure they're soluble so plants' roots can just suck them up in water. Soluble means they just dissolve in water, like if you made salt water. It's a very sophisticated 
audience, is, Josh. All right, so I'm sorry to get deep into it, but it's important. Going, keep going. So um, these water-soluble nutrients, every time a plant drinks, it eats, basically. So um, their leaves have to be turgid, they have to be out and stiff so that water can evaporate through them so they can do photosynthesis and they can exchange gas. So they're constantly like little water pumps, these plants. And when you put chemical fertilizer down, they suck it right up. But it short, it short circuits this biological process by which plants normally feed where they have this symbiotic relationship between soil organisms and their roots. And it's a pretty complex process that happens in ecology. When you short circuit it, you get two effects. One is you can force plants to grow really quickly. Um, and the other is you essentially kill all the microbiology that's in the soil and you end up reducing soil organic matter over time. And why does this matter? Soil organic matter keeps soil from eroding and, and it retains moisture. And so you basically lose uh, the ecology in favor of chemistry. People sort of following me so far? This is, of all right, good. They're following you, Josh. I feel bad jumping into the chemistry. Yes, so yes. When you, when, you, when you do that, um, and then you try to go back, it's a little bit hard. And so what folks who try to go back do, particularly when they're deeply invested in a chemical system, is they try to substitute the chemical inputs for organic ones. And folks who are organic farmers call this substitution organic farming. So you take organic uh, processed chicken shit and you use it instead of chemical fertilizers. And you take or organically uh, derived pesticides and use them instead of chemical pesticides. And it doesn't work very well and it's really expensive. And what I've heard you just described, Stuart, is essentially proof that organic substitution agriculture doesn't work. Where organic agriculture works and works really well and study after study all over the world shows this is when you actually go back to a process that's based on ecological principles. When you do that, soil organic matter increases. There, actually, whether you get certified by the USDA or not, the quality of the fruit and produce that comes out of it increases. If you look at just nutrient content, uh, particularly mineral and vitamin content, peaks back up. Um, you have pest resilience. You have all of these things that you were, I think, hoping for when you, when you jumped into this system. But if you just try to substitute organically allowable inputs, fertilizers and pesticides, you end out with a sort of less good chemical system. Um, it's hard to do the ecological one at scale. There are some folks who've done it well um, in Europe, some in the US, some in Australia do it very well. Um, but once you make that jump, generally the, the system actually looks different. You get a drop in yields at the beginning, and then you get a long-term increase. You get an increase in expenses at the beginning, and then a long-term drop in expenses, which is sort of the reverse curve from what you described. So I, I would no, just- No, he was on the way. He was possibly on the way to that. The lower no, yield- No, I, would, could I have did risen. it for seven years. Yeah. Okay, because what I forgot to say is it took three years to get, to get, certified. To, to get certified, and then we did it for six or seven years after that and are continuing to it do it. It was a biblical and we period. we see none of these results. And okay. you were getting God's message. Yes. <laughs> but I guess what I would say is, and I don't know the particular ways in which that land was being managed, what you described to me was like a, a, a very standard curve for trying to do a substitution organic shift. And it's, it's really hard when you hit a certain scale to shift into an ecologically based agriculture because you just have so many acres, it's a real challenge. So I could imagine your farm managers figuring out how are we gonna do this, the only viable way, given our scale and our setup and the way we are operating is to shift in that system. And so you see that drop um, that's hard and a lot of people take that as evidence that organic doesn't work. For me, that's barking up the wrong tree. Um, and, and if you look at all of these great examples of ecologically based agriculture, whether it has an organic label on it or not, you see long-term increases in yields, you see increases in all of these ecological measures, and you see increases in resiliency. Um, and resiliency really matters in agriculture because over five years, um, the chemical one may go great, but over 20 years or 50 years, one pest can come in and knock out uh, an entire crop or even an entire industry, and resiliency, uh, ecological diversity, guards against that. <coughs> How much more? Of <coughs> the There's one more thing, which okay. is that the other thing is organic has incredible promise for addressing climate change. And so there are all of these studies. Um, if you look at, um, the, the, if you could change all of agriculture in the U.S. overnight to organic agriculture that's ecologically based, which clearly you can't just do, but if you did it, it would more than double, uh, we would meet our Kyoto protocols twice over. So it would reduce our greenhouse. Our what protocol? Kyoto <coughs> protocols twice over. So it would more than uh, double the amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions we would have needed to meet if we were part of Kyoto. So there's this incredible promise uh, for organic agriculture to actually not only, um, not only do less harm, but actually create good. So farming could be not the problem, but be the solution.
I, I asked Josh to defend organic farming, and could there be a better defense? Yeah, but I don't think that's true. Well, so here's, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, it's I'm, nice to say about all these examples. I ain't seen one of them. Okay? But I'm, I'm coming back to Stuart because. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to say and to tell these stories, so, so th but there ain't no facts. So the accusation is essentially you are taking a short-term view of your land management for your selfish profit-generated oh. motives. <laughs> um, and, and I would say that you probably, I want you to defend your view of land conservation because it's something you talk a lot about. So presumably, so talk about what the land looked like. So when it was beautiful and you saw these wonderful wildflowers, did you say to your farm managers, mow them down? <laughs> you know, no, we're, we're not going to have this anymore. I don't think that you are taking a short-range view of your land. And we talked about some of the principles that you're putting into effect to use lower inputs. So what are your views of long-term land conservation and keeping yields up? Well, let me say it may be different because when <coughs> we're, we deal strictly with tree crops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're very careful about, we, now again, Farming is becoming more and more scientific. Um, and I think what Josh said was true. I mean, basically what you're trying to do is maximize the inputs that nature does um, and do it as efficiently as possible. And I think what you're able to do then is to take every place is not ideal. And what you're trying to create is the ideal uh, environment for your plant wherever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can vary the amount of water. We have, our, our, our crops are all irrigated. And they're essentially in the desert, I mean, they're California. Well, it's also the most productive farming area in the world. Now, if we didn't do irrigation, we wouldn't get those crops. So, so if you were in the ideal place and maybe you did organic farming, it might work, but then you couldn't get anywhere near the productivity that you need to feed, you know, to feed the nation, so to speak. Now, I know there was an FDA, I mean, again, I don't know that there's too much real science in this area that I could find, but I know there was a disclaimer on the F that the FDA said that there's no proof that organic farming is healthier, that the crops are healthier. So the things that Josh is saying, it's nice to say, but I don't necessarily, have, I've never seen that proof, mm -hmm. okay? And, and yes, if you want to be a hobby farmer, and if you want to go buy a tomato at $7, uh, you might get some ideal organic tomato. Like your wife. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, <laughs> buying a $7 organic tomato, right, yes, okay. Yes, we're calling yes. you an organic right. tomato. Now, let me say this, we grow, we grow our own oranges in Beverly Hills. Now, I would say that each orange probably costs about $12, you know. And then we also grow our own, some of our own food on our land. But that's hard for a lot of people to do. Yeah. You know, okay. something I'm at a loss for and I'm unfamiliar with, I think that perhaps when you also, Josh, and I certainly read about organic farming and the difference between the topsoil levels, the health of the land, we're not thinking about tree crops. I, I think that, um, the fact that you're only tree crops, we're thinking so much more about general food crops that grow uh, into, the, into the ground and that have such intensive inputs. I actually don't know. The inputs might be lower for tree crops than they are for, you know, corn, for the kind of food crops that we're usually thinking of. Corn, corn and soy are much higher, but tree crops take a good deal of nutrients because they're producing these nutrient-dense fruits. But again, you, you have to balance the nutrients in the soil to maintain the soil, mm -hmm. and, we're, and we're very careful about that. And again, you, you, you use what we call fertigation, as you say. So when, yeah. we, when we irrigate, we put the fertilizers in it. We constantly look at the leaves and have measures to, you know, because the other thing you don't want to waste. I mean, some of the problems with and what people call industrial agriculture is they're concerned it affects the water levels and it gets into the, you know, in, yeah. in, in, into drinking water. Well, that, that's a problem if it's not done right, but one can solve that without going to organic. It's just making sure that you, you monitor and make sure that the water doesn't, you know, doesn't, all you're doing is putting an adequate amount in that doesn't go any deeper than so into the soil. So there is an excess residue that's being drained off. So one thing that, that I'm realizing just listening to this is, um, 
you know, Corby said that I had some evil profit minded thing. For me, it's not that at all. You've, you've got all these acres of, of uh, trees and you're trying to sell them and you want to grow them in a way that makes sense ecologically and from a market perspective. And what I realized is one of the challenges is what you said, which is that you're growing trees in a desert. And so the way you're, tr you're doing it, which is the way to grow trees in a desert, is essentially like a hydroponic operation. Folks are familiar with hydroponics, right? You have roots are grounded in, oh in, in <laughs> basically in, in sand um, in this case. And it's like an enormous hydroponic operation, but the ground is your hydroponic, a little sponge you put a plant in. And so this is the way to grow trees in a desert. And trying to do it organically doesn't make sense. Now, a lot of folks would argue, and not the people who own all the acres with the trees on them, should you be growing trees in a desert in a water limited environment anyways and that's that's a really big and deep they grow <laughs> it's a, it's a deep old conversation pomegranates i mean nuts particularly and you know you need nuts nuts grow it essentially they're desert crops but you can, you can have enough soil organic matter so you can have a balanced nutrient system in there and not be uh, juicing them every time you irrigate with uh, with chemical fertilizers which is how they've grown historically. But where, where you are, the way to do what you're doing is not organic. And I think that when you tried to do it that way, it failed. And that is a really reasonable thing. Well, That's we what don't happened. grow it all. In the, I mean, some parts are irrigated and some parts are, mm -hmm. well, they're all irrigated. But there are other places that grow uh, the same crops without irrigation because they're desert crops. They just don't get the yields. And mm -hmm. also, am I not so right, you, but historically there were lots of nuts and citrus in California before there were pesticides and fertilizers, right? So, I mean, it, it, there was a, a precedent that these things grew naturally because I think people forget that, like, before 1895, um, everything was organic by default. Yeah. So, you know, California was already the most productive. Yeah, but how about cost? I mean, I think if you look back and see what the costs were based upon incomes, that it was very, very expensive. So you're also limiting, to me, what's also extremely important on the side of the ability to bring healthy foods to more people because it's reasonably priced is in itself a big saving. It's a big saving for health. And, you know, nutrition is very important for health. And so, you know, we, you can't, you, you, even today, fruits and vegetables are quite expensive compared to, uh, you know, whatever it's, you know, yeah. salt and grease, but... Um, <laughs> salt and <laughs> grease! Why did I think of those terms this morning? Yeah, salt and grease. I'm going to be using those a lot. Um, before we get to health of people, though, and affordability right. and local, which is all tied up, and, and it's, it was what I want to get to next, um, land. We, we can't leave the health of the land question and the environment because that's so much un under all this. Were you measuring residues and the health of the land before and after organic? You know, was there this brief seven year low yield but paradise for well, the health of the soil? I, I don't know what that means. I mean, basically, if the soil isn't healthy, you're not going to get a good yield. Mm -hmm. And we don't, basically, we've had, well, <coughs> we bought some acreage when we first started. We have citrus trees that are 80 years old. Now mm -hmm. they wouldn't be producing anymore if the land wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. So this nonsense about unhealthy land, I don't think that has anything to do with organic. I think there's other problems that create that. You know, the way you, um, now again, we're not- We're both cocking our heads, I don't yeah, No, no, I mean, you know, the, the way um, you deal with the topsoil and the way you'd use the tractors and you know, all that sort of stuff, particularly in the Midwest where you're constantly, you have new crops every year. But I don't think it has anything to do with organic, personally. I think these are all myths. All myths. But you have you were telling me about consciously trying to use lower pesticides and fertilizers. Right, right? but that's not organic. No, it's, no, it's organic not organic. Organic says you can only use certain types of pesticides, OK? Mm -hmm. And by the same token, they're not particularly you know, less dangerous than the pesticides we use. But I presume that was, I, I thought that was for two reasons. It was for the health of the soil and water. No, 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 you assume that. Okay, correct I, me. No, that's what, the, that's what this rhetoric is all about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk and no proof. So when you're, lo when you're using lower amounts of fertilizer and pesticide, is it to increase efficiency and lower costs? Absolutely. Also, yes, I mean, it's to, it's to increase efficiency and also it's environmental. I mean, you need certain inputs and you want to you want to limit them both for for cost. You want to optimize. Uh, we do a huge amount of experimentation because of our size on what's the absolute 
appropriate inputs to, you know, at, at a minimum to get the maximum yield. We're always measuring that. So, uh, but that has to do with economics because you want to, you know, the difference between cost and price. Mm -hmm. That's what you're left with. Well, of course, that's what you build your whole yeah. business on. Um, let's move to buying local. And um, we'll let Josh have the first word this okay. time. So do you want to make a case for buying local? And in fact, we haven't discussed in advance um, where you stand on this, because this is such an evolving question in the food world right now. And what are Slow Foods' thoughts, and what are your thoughts about the advantages of buying local, and what local means to you? So, you know, I think, big picture, the most important thing to recognize across all of these questions is just that there's a story behind your food. Um, that the food you eat has a story behind it, and that story has ecological uh, implications, it has justice implications, people, it has implications uh, around cultural traditions, around land use, economic implications. And the story behind your food can be one that you're really proud of. That's possible. And that if you knew the story behind your food, um, often it would be a story that would actually make you lose your appetite. Um, and so we should strive to eat food that has a story behind it that you'd be really excited by. Um, and that's the simple idea. And that, for me, touches the question around organic. Um, and it also touches the question on local. Um, I th local. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. So local. For me, there's been a lot of hype about the 100-mile diet, the 200-mile diet. I think that actually misses the point. Um, for me, the reason there's a reason local matters. It's not an intrinsic value. Local matters because uh, a lot of the time, most of the time, if food is sourced locally, the story behind the food's better. Um, that's not always true. Um, at UNC Chapel Hill, they're a few miles away from the Smithfield pork producers, and Smithfield is a notoriously uh, intensive, ecologically deleterious, and, and uh, unjust place for workers as well, and, and they grow almost 85% of the hogs in this country. Now the purchasers for the dining services at UNC Chapel Hill said, we have local pork, right? There's nothing about that local pork that actually means they should be proud, right? So what do you mean when you say local? Um, for me, there's reasons that local matters. Local can matter because of the greenhouse gas emissions linked to it. Um, so you mean the transport of food. Transport of food. So if you bring food from far away, to where you are, you're burning greenhouse gas emissions all the way there. Now, there's a, a pretty intense debate about this right now. There was a study. The on the Atlantic.com. Yeah. Very intense. You'll see the study from uh, on, on New Zealand lamb. The, do you know this study? Why? James McWilliams is yes. like our chief so contributor. There's there. this great study that said, hey, it's actually, it is <coughs> less carbon emissions to buy lamb from New Zealand if you're in the, in the UK than it is to buy lamb from the UK. And they did a deep study of it and examined it. Well, if you look at the study, they studied lamb grown in New Zealand on pasture, which is a, the right way to grow lamb, to lamb grown in the UK. So lamb grown in New Zealand on pasture, as opposed to lamb grown in the UK that was fed corn and soybeans in these intensive feedlots, which is the worst way to grow lamb. And the folks who funded the study were also those New Zealand lamb growers. So this is the one study that says local is worse than global. Um, to me, it's like if you, I'm trying to think of a good example, it'd be like going to my Uncle Frank and Barry Bonds and doing a study on the health of the two of them. And my Uncle Frank never exercises, he just sits on the couch. And the net result of the study would be like, it's actually really better for you to chew tobacco and do steroids, right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Like they, they compared the worst of the worst local to the best of the best global, right? So that to me is, is sort of silly. Um, I think what makes sense is you look at the actual impact of the way food is grown. Uh, one, one, if you go in and buy um, local food directly from the person who sells it. And uh, look them in the eye. And look them in the eye and talk to them, ask them questions. I think there's real value to that. I think there's value from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, but I also think that you're putting your dollars into a local economy, uh, which is important and has a net result for that economy that's important. I also think that it builds human relationships that are vital. Um, food for us is such an alienated thing. We're so far away from that story that if we can be a little bit closer to it, I think we're better for it and the grower's better for it. And I recognize that this is touchy stuff, but I actually think that... You mean touchy-feely. Touchy-feely <laughs> actually matters because I actually believe that culture matters, not, mm -hmm. not just science. And so I think that community matters, not just science, and that community has real hard on-the-ground outcomes if it's strong. And if it's weak, um, it has real consequences. So I believe that local matters for a lot of reasons. 
Um, I don't think that means that UNC Chapel Hill should be proud of buying Smithfield pork, right? I think fundamentally the reason local matters is because there's a story behind your food, often the local one's better. Um, if you go to a farmer's market, you buy directly from farmers, the USDA did this study, it said, if you believe that organic is better, which is still up for debate, right? Um, that one in three of the growers selling directly locally is organic. That's the way that growers differentiate themselves in a local market. Um, so you're more likely to be encountering growers who are a, maybe a scale that matters to you, maybe of an ecological footprint that matters to you when you buy local. There's a lot of reasons why I think it matters, and I, and I don't believe um, for a minute that we should just draw a circle around ourselves 100 miles or 200 miles or 500 miles um, and say we're only going to eat from inside that circle. I think really we need to be curious about the story behind our food. I completely agree, and I, it's been the basis of a lot of my food writing in the Atlantic. It's what I advocate for people. But when I say people, it's a certain class, and we yeah. haven't talked about class, and we haven't talked about economic resources. But before I bring that in, did you have any reactions to what to Josh's defense of local? No, I, I, I think that um, <coughs> what I see, again, is, is in some of these crops particularly, even in our citrus, uh, not so much in our nut crop, is that... Um, because people, what I tell everybody is, the best quality product you're gonna get in produce, in fruits and vegetables, is when it's the cheapest. So when you're spending a lot of money on a- Say that again. No, it's absolutely correct. That the cheaper the product is in the produce, you know, generally, the better the quality is. The reason for that is that every drug, everybody in, you know, particularly in the US, wants everything all the time which means you want oranges, um, you know, 12 months Sorry, of the year, yeah. and you want navel oranges 12 months of the year. Used to be, and so you import them from countries, you know, and, and so they, they don't, they're, they're not completely ripened, so when they come over, you don't get the quality, you don't, you, they, they're not naturally ripened, so they're, they're not taste, you know, not tasty. You get, uh, I mean, you get fruit, apples that you can't even eat anymore, you know. Yeah. So I Most do believe, of them. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's all has to do with the ability to look good and to ship the product and to buy it inexpensively. So I think that local, however, and, and then oh, the, the reason that it's cheaper is because also in the U.S. what happens is the farmers, the, if they can get to market a little earlier, they get a premium for the product. And if they can stay a little longer, they get a premium. But that's not a natural time, so they have certain... Um, they, they develop ways to create that, but it's not optimum for the taste of the fruit. So your argument in theory is, is the most strict seasonality there can be because the cheapest means the most availability. That means it's the most in season. This is the yeah, peak. It's a natural season. time for it, right. Okay, so I get, I get the defense of the argument. I think there are lots of other things that enter into the actual price of food, right. like size, like efficiency of scale. Um, like, isn't one of your arguments about Fiji water that it's produced very ecologically where it's produced and compared to other production models, it's actually cheaper and has a lower carbon footprint? I mean, so there, there are lots of variations. It, it, there, there, right. it's, a, it's a sliding scale. But I would say, again, in local, I mean, so I'm a big advocate of local, but again, if you want to get oranges or citrus and you live in Boston, it's hard to grow them there. You know, so I mean, so you do have to have some <laughs> availability. That's up to people, you know, what they what they want to eat. So for a I couple of years, I wouldn't eat citrus except I live in Boston. When I went to oh, visit good. my father in Florida over the you winter. showed them, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. What do you got scurvy? Then I got scurvy. Well, no, I didn't get scurvy. Um, however, yes, we want our products all year round, and I don't think we're we are willing to abandon this. I think I'm going to open to questions. Um, and I, I don't even have to wait very long. You, then you. Um, I'll repeat them for you. I, you know, I'm not a sophisticated meal writer, but I write meal writing, so I do No know. better studies. <laughs> I do really like the notion about you were talking about ecological farming for the whole cycle, not just one piece or the other. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So um, chemical agriculture, organic substitution agriculture, where you're substituting inputs versus ecologically sound agriculture. 
One thing that's important is that organic means a lot of things right now for a lot of different people. So Except implied that many organic producers are not ecologically sound. That is in right. In that differentiation. And, and, I, and I totally you agree with that. just slipped it in. Yeah, and so I was going to say, that's exactly <laughs> where I was going. So organic now legally means that it meets a certain set of standards. And those standards don't necessarily mean that it's ecologically sound. Great. So ecologically sound at the biggest picture that we're taking our cues about what to do as farmers from ecology rather than from chemistry. And so in chemistry, we analyze what happens chemically in the plant. And we say it needs this much of X and this much of Y and this much of Z. It's generally NPK, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. And we make sure that it has them in the right quantities in dissolved water. And so we just look at the plant as a chemical machine. In an ecological model, we look at how soil functions and how plants function and how that ecosystem relates to itself. It's a much more complicated picture. And we don't try to do the chemistry. We try to mimic the ecological cycles that are happening in an ecosystem. So that might be that um, organic matter is decaying, uh, microbes and fungi are eating it and over time slowly releasing nutrients are making them semi-available. Um, and then through cation exchange, plant roots are picking them up. At the same time, some of the organisms that are in there decaying stuff might be like ne nematodes is one little tiny organism that lives in healthy soil. Um, there are beneficial nematodes that live in that decaying matter that will eat bad nematodes that eat roots. So there's this whole ecological system that you mimic. And when I was farming, I was growing vegetables, not tree fruits. My role, I saw it, was to actually build healthy ecological cycles. And the plants followed, actually. And what I saw was yield increased and cost went down um, as I was growing food. Uh, because instead of focusing on buying the inputs, uh, the chemical inputs, and making sure the plants had them in the chemical ratios that they needed, I made sure that the soil organisms just had raw organic matter. They could decay. But I think he's asking for P&L sheets, names yeah. of places he can well, invest in. Yeah. How many acres did you farm? I was, I was tiny. I was really tiny. Well, how many acres? I was two acres. It was yeah, right okay. there. It's a yeah. little easier than yeah. with 124,000. No, it's really hard at 124,000, <laughs> which begs the question, should we be growing most of our food on 125,000 acre plots? Well, um, <sighs> and so, and it's just a question. I'm not saying you should. You know, you get to cost. I mean, you, yeah, you, you, get to you, cost. Know, you work for free. Yeah. I, um, I find it very hard to get people to work for free for me. It's hard to do. I tell you, it's really as hard. As hard as you try. As, as hard as we try, right. Actually, we're there's doing a, there's, pretty well at it. <laughs> but there's a real risk to the system we have right now. And that's not to say that anyone who's a part of it is bad or doing a bad well, thing in particular. Take it but man, you look at what happened in Germany in the last few weeks with sprouts. You've got 43 people dead in Germany, now people showing up sick in Spain. Organic agriculture. The issue is not organic, not organic. The issue is scale. You look at DeCoster eggs, the worst of the worst, not organic agriculture um, earlier on. Uh, they, ha they had to recall 500, what was million. It, 500 million eggs, a half a billion yeah. eggs. It's like something like 1.3 eggs per person in this country recalled. They had people sick in every state. The reason why that's a problem in this particular instance is scale and consolidation. When you consolidate markets that much, it comes back to this question of resiliency which shows up in ecological resiliency in terms of response to pests. It shows up in resiliency in, uh, when it comes to disease or distribution routes. You become very brittle, very vulnerable when you consolidate at this scale and you cause the opportunity for very bad things to happen, either ecological collapse or a lot of people to get sick in a lot of places at once. Okay. No, so in, no investment tips from Josh on that oh. scale. <laughs> I um, have some, but <laughs> we can talk afterwards. Okay, fine. You're, you're the next one. <clears throat> Don't look. And then second, on local, um, you know, Josh Tree, which I think is the right to refer to, makes a very good case. You know, he asked for the opposite of your brother, crossed over to the point where he could have more wonderful people on the farm. This is no longer true for him. Right? It's not physically possible. And so, you know, so going back to that thing, I mean, for example, on local and how we increase the quality is really great, but we may not be able to improve the growing population on a significant amount of time. Hmm. 
you should look at the IAA STD. This is the, the major study on how to feed the world that the, the UN put together with the UNDP and the Food and Agriculture Organization and 400 independent scientists and industry. Industry walked out at the last minute um, essentially because the findings said we don't need a chemical intensive agriculture to feed the world. What we need is regionally adaptive, ad adapted agriculture to feed the world combined with some political reform, some land reform, agricultural extension based on ecological principles. And this was the fundamental global study. The UN still points to it over and over again. Um, it's, it's very underreported in the US and US food and agriculture um, industry walked out of the study because the findings weren't to their liking. There are other studies um, that have been much more boosted by them that leave the, the minute opening that in order to feed the world, we may need chemical agriculture. And they're, they're taking that as proof that we need particularly genetically modified crops and chemical agriculture. But if you look at the fundamental foundational study on this that all of the intergovernmental organizations did in cooperation, it says that not certified organic, but an agriculture that's regionally adapted and based on ecological principles, combined with land reform, political reform, and some good extension um, is, the, is the way to keep people from going hungry in the future. It's also important to recognize we, we have more food than ever before. We, and like I look at 2008, we had more food than ever before was grown in that year. Uh, more people were obese than ever before in the history of the world in that year. More profit was made by major food companies than ever before in the history of the world in that year. And more people went hungry than ever before in the history of the world that year. So we have uh, assumed and taken as fact the idea that there's not enough food for people. And everyone who's deeply engaged in these issues of working for these intergovernmental organizations tends to come back to the idea that global hunger is a question of political will, not of global production. I, 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 I want to... I'd, I'd, I'd like to get to a here and now economics of who can afford what. Mm. So um, I, I'd like to ask Stuart about talking about um, who you market to and what socioeconomic levels you're marketing to. I imagine that the bulk nuts are different from this packaged product. So can you talk a little about the market sectors you reach? Well, I think we just reach a broad a category of people that want to eat healthy food. And I think when you're talking about food, now again, I'm, this is a little above my you know, pay range about, you know. <laughs> 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 uh, is that there may be a lot of food, but it may not be the healthy food, okay? There's a huge amount of corn being produced and everything has corn in it. But what we need to eat more of, and I, it's not just me saying that, it's, you know, the world is, is fruits and vegetables very healthy for you people but that's where you, you you're going to have a problem producing it okay and now as far as our it's interesting because I was thinking you know, this, we are in the extreme okay on natural farming in one of our areas and that's I bought a winery recently and not only are they organic which I'm not sure what that you means. never intend to make money do you no I'm uh, no. a winery a winery okay with the idea that that's going to be the challenge to make money but they not only <coughs> grow it organically, okay, and they hand this and do that, and they have somebody, some, some new thing, which is this, this person comes in from France who talks about something bionic. I don't know, you must biodynamic. know. Biodynamic. Yeah, biodynamic, bio where, you, where you fertilize on a certain time when the moon is out and you <laughs> water it, you know. And it's By like the way, the heat, you're talking about the crazy extremes of exactly the yeah. principles Josh has been advocating. It started with biodynamic farming. But unfortunately, when these persons from France come around, they start talking about buried cow horns with manure. No, no, exactly. Them, buried cow and horns. The and, yeah, right. They and bury the cow horns and they throw whatever they do on it. Now, but we can sell that yeah. bottle of wine for $80. So it doesn't make that much difference what they do. So I'm probably not going to interfere with that. Okay. But. <laughs> um, if you're getting a yield of um, 1,500 pounds an acre or 3,000 pounds an acre and you basically have the same cost, it costs a lot more to sell that product. So mm -hmm. look, we're, we're doing a you know, big, big export business of nuts into Mexico. So obviously they can afford it. So it's, 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 it's what people around. are willing to pay for food. I mean, in other words, in Europe, they pay a much higher percentage of their income for food and they want good food. So um, I don't think we aim at a particular uh, 
group of people who, it would, with any of our products, that, that are particularly um, uh, wealthy. Now, the problem with our, and this is a, an interesting thing, uh, the problem with our pomegranate juice is it's pomegranate juice. And it costs a lot of money to make. Mm -hmm. However, there are other people that have a much better idea because they sell pomegranate juice that virtually has no pomegranate juice. Doesn't cost them anything near what it costs us, so you can get it much cheaper. However, you're not getting pomegranate juice. This is our labeling session yeah. in two days. You all have to come back <laughs> and hear Linda Resnick. We're going to be hearing a lot about this. What percentage of your sales are United States? I'd say about, uh, with all our product, uh, maybe half. And how much of it do you directly sell? All of it. I didn't know that. No, I not all of it to the consumer. You know, but we, we sell it to the, what we call the gatekeeper, to the, to the retailer. Uh -huh. We basically sell, I'd say we sell 80% to the retailer. We that's that's yeah. direct sale. I thought you did wholesale mostly of your citrus. No, we sell all to the supermarkets, yeah. Oh, and it's all branded. That's a... Well, no, our, yeah, our, our, yeah. But um, yeah, that's really we try to do, you know, direct. Yeah. Wow, that is different. So that is direct sales. Um, yeah. our, our food is getting very individual. Um, how to handle the differences between a farmer, a small scale or large scale, then you can make a list. Yeah. Bottom line, they're going to decide what the best price is then for whatever they're growing, whatever they can grow. And I think it's true that the smaller scale, In their little right-minded way. And they're not at a scale, they're not at a scale where they can afford to do much. I, no. um, I live in agricultural Missouri with 35 miles outside of Washington, D.C., and we have a small farm. And um, a lot of the folks around me are really struggling with this. And they do donate a lot of the food, but they don't sell to farmer's markets for soup kitchens and things like that. But they're at the attention. I mean, the farmers are not making a lot of money off of what they grow. Yeah. But when you say are they struggling, are they struggling to abandon organic because it's too expensive and go to no, conventional or to abandon farming? No, I, it's a, well, no, they're not trying to abandon farming. And, and where I am, you know, there's some people who are saying local is more important than organic or they're doing this kind of ecological organic farming um, and not selling certified wheat because they're small scale and it's just too hard yeah. to do that. It's just ridiculous. And most of their customers are educated to that and they want local. You're selling it to Linda. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be organic to be an heirloom. Yeah. And, right. it's, and it's probably more organic than a lot of stuff that's labeled organic. That's, that's true. But how do I how do I deal with the fact that we need to feed people who, you know, there, there's a tension there, and, and, and that's a concern. I don't know. If so can you repeat the name of that report? Because this is the trump card we're all pulling out. And I, in fact, I want to give you the site of I'm this. About yeah. So I can, I can talk to that um, absolutely because I see it all over the country through work that our chapters do and our partners do. Um, and when I was a farmer, really small farm, super ecological practices, very high-end product, I made a terrible living. And I was selling salad mix for an obscene amount of money to a very wealthy clientele, doing the right thing, but also looking at people coming to the farmer's market who in that community were mostly Mexican immigrants who couldn't afford to buy the, sometimes the crops I was growing from their region that they were so excited to see, that's a real tension. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that we not uh, place that responsibility on the farmers, because the farmers are a part of suffering a broken system in this case. They can't be the solution on their own. Um, so I've seen some Band-Aids that I think are great, but I acknowledge are Band-Aids, and I've seen some hope for a bigger change. Band-Aids are Link the Food Assistance Program, SNAP or WIC, or what we called food stamps, with local, uh, with local and sustainable agriculture. So your, your food stamps are at least valid at farmer's markets and ideally worth more at farmer's markets. Those programs have boosted up rural economies. Massachusetts, we're doing it. All over the country. Massachusetts, Michigan, there's all over there. It's great programs. It leaves a huge gap. It leaves a huge gap. Yeah. And then the people that are going to send them all to Canada here, they're just feeding them to the farmers. Yeah. 
there's a huge gap. And so the real challenge with that gap is we, there's a lot of reasons. One of the core ones, I think, is our federal policy um, has created a structure where it's really hard to grow healthy food unless you hit a certain scale. And so we've got uh, what I call it the food pyramid scheme, where you've got the food pyramid that says you should eat this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And then you've got our subsidy system, which essentially is inverts that triangle. So we're subsidizing the worst of the worst. Um, and we are essentially bailing out agribusiness for about $25 billion a year, even though they're one of the most profitable industries in our country. But what are your chapter? Because okay, so our, what our chapters are doing are helping with farmers markets to do these Band-Aid things and linking up organic farms with uh, gleaning projects to get stuff in food banks that's local and sustainable. But those are really Band-Aid issues because the issue is structural. We have real structural inequity in our food system, and the underlying issue is poverty. Uh, and so you can't hang on a small farmer's back the responsibility to eradicate poverty, right? Because they're actually, for the most part, on the edge of it themselves. And so we need to work to actually uh, change the way we structure food and farming in terms of our federal policy and have it aligned with our nutrition policy. And we also need to look at these issues actually as justice issues and issues about poverty. Um, I think that that's the only way forward. What that means is it's a long-term long fight. It's really important that we not just say, well, poor people Jesus. should, poor people should spend more at the farmer's market. That, that doesn't work. We actually need to deal with it structurally. Um, that's an optimism thing. We had a woman back there who's been patient. Sorry, how did we what? Hall. Hall, yes. The transportation costs go up, so they must have other Oh, issues. all that chicken shit. Yeah, I'm sure it did. I mean, I'm not even counting out. It was yeah. just the amount that we had to put on. Four times the amount of nitrogen to get the same nutrition. So a lot of it just went to waste, went into the air, so it wasn't used. <coughs> so I don't agree. I mean, look, my experience is totally different. Now, Josh's experience is on two acres, okay? <laughs> Oh, uh, right. No, it, look, I think that that's what I'm saying. I think this whole concept can be 